Hello, everyone, and welcome again to another one of my Podbean podcast and YouTube videos on countymidspez22.com. Very, very pleased today. Have a repeat customer, a repeat person. The feedback was so great from the interview that Rodney and I did with Dr. David Dean the last time. Uh, I noticed he had published something on Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, and so I wanted to have him back on to talk some Nietzsche. Before we do that, I just want to remind people that Dr. Dean is associate professor of theology at the Atlantic School of Theology, which is uh, somewhere in Nova Scotia, I do believe, right? Halif Halifax, Nova Scotia. And the Atlantic School of Theology, we didn't talk about this last time. It's an ecumenic, I think in the United States, we would call that a theological union or something like that. Right. <clears throat> Where it's, right, uh, yeah. After, after the council, um, there was a tremendous ecumenical movement, as, as, as you all know, and um, there were three different theological colleges that combined to make the um, Atlantic School of Theology as an ecumenical hub for theology. And to this day, we um, train seminarians for Anglican Holy Orders, for United Church of Canada Ministry. We don't, sadly, um, train Roman Catholic seminarians, but we've an awful lot of lay offerings for Roman Catholics. That's great. I know in the United States, theological unions tend to be progressive theological wastelands of the first <laughs> order. <laughs> uh, uh, and so I, I, I only mention that because some of my viewers will go, oh, a theological union, those places are terrible. But I assure you that if David Dean is teaching at the Atlantic School of Theology, then it must be it must be of, of high quality. It doesn't have a ton of students. I looked it up. It's like 140 or 50 or something like that. Yeah, we, we our, our main programs are MDivs and MAs. Yeah. And so it's largely a graduate school, although we now have some diploma programs, including a diploma, diploma program in the new evangelization, which is attracting an awful lot of Roman Catholics. And it's um, well, that's fantastic. It's fun well, more power, more power. I wanted to give your institution a plug. I didn't do that. Thank last you very time. much. Appreciate so that. We're, we're, we're given a nice plug here. So anybody interested in pursuing graduate degrees in theology, especially if you're up in Canada, take take a look at uh, the Atlantic School of Theology. Anyway, I also want to remind readers I and mean, viewers, uh, I should say, I, I got to get this right, of the latest hey. book by David Dean, The Tyranny of the Banal, all right, on the renewal of Catholic moral theology. This is the book we discussed in our last episode, and I wanted to give that another plug because dad gum it it's a good book thank you so much <laughs> i was rereading it again some more last week i finally finished it i had only read like three-fourths of it before and then i finally finished it i thought wow dang this this that, that's a smart feller that david dean so that was great great book thank you for writing it um, thank you thank you very much anyway today we're talking some oh and by the way yeah rodney hauser's with us <laughs> sorry rodney and rodney is all tanned up now he's down in florida on vacation uh, because his wife is from Florida and they love Florida and they go down there. I mean, but you do it opposite, Rodney. I mean, you go down to Florida in the summer, uh, you know, and you should do it in the winter. But all right, you're teachers. So we understand you got summer. It's a little off. cooler today. It's only 90. So yeah, it's so. been hot up here, too. So there you go. Anyway, let's get. And everybody knows, you know, Rodney Hauser is my former colleague at DeSales University, which is near Allentown, Pennsylvania. Anyway. Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, I've, I've long been fascinated by Nietzsche. I'm not an expert in Nietzsche. My understanding of Nietzsche is probably somewhat superficial, I guess. Uh, my introduction to him was in my early 20s. I was reading Henry de Lubac's famous book, The Drama of Atheist Humanism, and he dealt extensively with Nietzsche in that book. And then I started reading Hans Urs von Balthasar, and he, he dealt some with Nietzsche as well. And so I started thinking, hmm, this this Nietzsche feller is somebody worth reading. So uh, you know, I, I you know stuff that was in translation, and I tried to read some German, uh, but my German was bad. But anyway, uh, I've always been fascinated by him, and I've always thought that it behooves Catholic thinkers to study Nietzsche because we can learn from Nietzsche, and that's that's why I think it was important here to focus on that. I mean, obviously, when figures like de Lubach, Balthazar, Ratzinger, all these guys engage Nietzsche, Guardini and others, that means that Nietzsche is onto something. Uh, maybe gets everything wrong in the end, but he's onto something. But I don't want to prejudice or preload the conversation. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Dean uh, and say, uh, ask you to sort of give us a sort of entry into uh, into Friedrich Nietzsche and, and maybe a little bit of analysis of his thought. 
Yeah, um, Nietzsche, his dates are 1844 to 1900, but after 1888, he is largely in a catatonic state after his famous um, breakdown in Turin. Um, there's a sense in which there's two Nietzsches. Um, there is the conventional Nietzsche, which is interesting, and then there's the Nietzsche which receives less attention, which I think is the is the really important Nietzsche for this for this age. When I speak about the conventional Nietzsche, he is a standard 19th century um, rejecter of metaphysics in favor of a of a of a fairly fairly arid materialism. Um, this is the Nietzsche who rejects uh, God, rejects um, all metaphysics, who sees a trajectory from Plato to Christianity to Kant, which is basically Christian Platonism for the masses, as he says. Um, and all these, in, in, in a manner not too dissimilar from Marx are, um, or Freud, are simply illusions. They are simply um, methods of control by the ascetic classes. And Nietzsche wants to take a sledgehammer to this, which he does in in works like The Twilight of the Idols and The Antichrist. Um, and so for, for Nietzsche, and this I think is quite interesting, metaphysics is itself a an act of cowardice. So like all these great 19th century thinkers, they, they, they encourage us to imagine an original position. And for Nietzsche, it's this sort of prehistoric human where everything can kill you. Every wild animal can kill you. Every disease can kill you. The wind can kill you. The rain can kill you. And everything is in flux. Everything is teeming and tumultuous. And you want to, you want to gain some control over this. And so you try to superimpose stasis onto it. And this is what language is for Nietzsche. And so while an apple is in a constant state of decay, the, the word apple is already a metaphysical construct because it encourages us to imagine an apple that isn't in, in, in decay. And so we use language straight away to, 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 to take the real world off its hinges, as he says, and establish a metaphysical construct that we can work with. And then we can do reason and we can plan and and we can use that metaphysical construct to gain control of the natural. But for Nietzsche, this is born of resentment against the natural. It's born of decadence. It's born of a desire to control. But all it does is stultify and rein in the, the, you know, the life-giving forces. And so this is the standard trajectory of Nietzsche as an atheist, as an anti-metaphysician, and as someone who, in a manner not a million miles from Marx, Freud, and the other giants of this era wants to, to reinvigorate the natural in its stead. Now, where Nietzsche is really interesting is mm. in his is in the way that his ontology and epistemology are unified with a critique which absolutely annihilates the secular and secular liberalism. This is, this is, this I think is the really fascinating Nietzsche. So Nietzsche has this philosophy of will to power. In 1883, he starts to read this guy called Willem Rue, who's an embryologist. And this guy provides the, the if you like, the, the science as Nietzsche sees it, um, which helps him understand things that he intuited all along. So the embryologist Willem Rue talks about cells and says that within the embryo, you have cells that want to give a kid blonde hair and brown hair. And in these cells, compete for space. And so because of this, Nietzsche gets the idea that that on the cellular level, everything is struggle. Everything is um is a is is, is a host of self-willing um entities which will only their own maximization or their own power. And these cells then comprise a self, and then these cells comprise a social order. And what it really is is just um an uncoordinated scramble for selfish gain. Now, because of this, we see the world um, filtered through our selfish ends. And therefore, we don't see the world as it is. We see the world on the basis of our particular needs, which is the basis for his perspectivism. So for Nietzsche, um, a self shaped by will to power will see the world in ways which can maximize this self or help this self to get ahead. And therefore, um, they will be trapped within the iron cage of their perspective. And so Nietzsche was tremendously important for me as, a, as, a, as an undergrad in the 90s because I was 
getting a sort of a, you know, a relativism from French post-structuralist thinking. And then there was um, what John Milbank calls an ontology of violence that was found in the Nietzschean tradition, but also echoed in people like Dan Dennis um, and these reductionist philosophers. And Nietzsche quite brilliantly, I think, combines the two. Um, and so because of this, what Nietzsche is, I think, is, is the is the termination of the secular in that what Nietzsche shows us is that if there is no good or true or, um, or, or God outside of our construction, then everything we hold dear is simply a construction and at that a ruse of power. So either there's a good in itself independently of us or what we call good is simply something that we come up with as part of our power relations. This is the fundamental thesis in his collection of essays published as On the Genealogy of Morality, when he says that good and evil um, simply refer to things that particular people say is nice or not nice or benefiting me or not benefiting me. But there is no good and evil in itself unless there is a good outside of this, which he forecloses upon. And that's utterly challenging, I think, for all secular thinkers. I don't believe that we can prove the reality of God as Christians, but I do believe we should be able to get a secular thinker to, to, to admit that without God, there is no good and evil. It is simply um, uh, a constellation of power from this or that group or this or that person. And Nietzsche, I think, and this is where John Milbank slightly underestimates him, while Nietzsche is only engaging with someone like Wilhelm Rue, an embryologist, you know, it, it doesn't even count as science relative to what we understand today. Um, more the, the more we know about um about how the mind how the brain edits sensory data into a narratival stream on the basis of our particular needs um, and interests the more we see that Nietzsche is probably right um we can go on later on to discuss um my thesis in that book which is that actually not only is Nietzsche right about this but Augustine and many others agrees with him 100% absent God, then a fallen human state, which sees everything in terms of its own need, leads to a, a relativism. Um, but we can talk about the theological consequences and theological responses, I think. The later. libido but, dominandi, the libido dominandi. Exactly, Absolutely. yeah. But, um, you know, but that's, but that's Nietzsche. And the history of Nietzsche's scholarship, I think, is a, is a history of largely secular atheistic thinkers who try and salvage Nietzsche, um, who try and, so I'm thinking about here, with people like um, Arthur Danto, um, in Dan Dennett's philosophical lexicon, there's an entry called the Arthur Dantist, um, which is a noun. And then he has, um, little Friedrich used to say the most remarkable things until we took him to the Arthur Dantist, Frau Nietzsche, you know? And so <laughs> um, one who straightens the teeth of exotic dogma. And so we have this idea that we don't want Nietzsche to be um, this philosopher of absolute power, because what do we do with him? And so people constantly try to try to try to um pacify Nietzsche and subdue Nietzsche and I think Kaufman and Danto and Sadler and there's an entire history of that um and I think it's it, and and for this reason the more theologically minded are often I think the best theological interpreters, the Lutheran pastor called Wolfgang Muller Leuter, um, who wrote an amazing book, which is translated in the 1990s into English as Nietzsche, his philosophy of contradiction and the contradictions in his philosophy, which I think stands as one of the great, the, the, the great works of Nietzsche scholarship. Um, but despite people's best intents, um, intentions, Nietzsche's um, energy, his anger, his deconstructive element, leaves almost nothing except, in one sense, Christianity standing. Because for Nietzsche, it comes down to this choice. He says in, in The Antichrist, have I not been understood? It's Dionysius versus the crucified. That, that there are only two options. Either one, you accept the reality of will to power and the perspectivism it leads to. That's one option. Or two, you take flight against this in an act of cowardice and decadence and embrace this slave morality. But unless you embrace the slave morality, which he sees as being beneath human dignity, you have to accept relativism and you have to accept an ontology of power and that's why Nietzsche I think is most damaging to um to secular liberalism 
th- there can be no room for it after Nietzsche. And we, yeah, we, we'll definitely build on that. I, I want to ask, though, and I'll turn it and Rodney, you can be thinking of what you want to ask. Uh, you mentioned you know, it's it's Dionysius versus the crucified one. But in Nietzsche's world, Dionysius doesn't simply represent, uh, you know, sensual pleasures. It doesn't represent, you know, wine, women and song. It doesn't represent an, an effulgence of Epicurean excess. Uh, it, it, it represents, from my perspective, and I'll get in and have you comment on this, David, it represents rather all of the basic elemental impulses of our human nature, which we have domesticated and tamed and are now uncaged. Uh, and that goes well beyond is the simply the hedonistic elements of Dionysianism. Yeah, that's a that's a great point, Larry. Um, Nietzsche was not the best interpreter of other people's thought. And Schopenhauer and Darwin, he both sees as sharing in in a, in, in a shared problem. He thinks that Schopenhauer's Will zu Leben or Darwinian thinking is about survival, survival of the fittest. Um, But he responds to that with one of my favorite quotes from Nietzsche, which is that every living thing does what it can not to survive, but to become more. You know, and and wow, so this is wow. and this is this is what he gets when he when, when he reads Willem Rue. He sees this single cell just reaching out for conflict, for struggle to overcome. And Nietzsche says it's the exact same with a little with a little dog. You know, you give a little dog a piece of fabric, and he pulls on it because he loves that. He loves that feeling. Um, Nietzsche's Nietzsche's understanding of altruism is is that a person would so is he hates the notion of the ascetic, who um, everybody has this will to become more. One, he doesn't interpret it so crudely, but we, after DNA, might interpret it as um, to to maximize our opportunities for genetic replication, right? To become yeah. high in our society so that we would have a bigger choice of, of of potential mates. And so this is this 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 fuse that is that that that, that is driving all activity. But the ascetic is living in a society, in a culture, in which the highest is not Achilles, is not Dionysus, but is the priestly caste, who, but is the, the ascetic. And so for Nietzsche, in a desire to, to become more, they actually castrate themselves, you know. And so in Christianity, he says, um, nature turns in on itself. It starts to it starts to cannibalize itself. This is one of the reasons why he hates Christianity so much. Um, but Nietzsche has no, you know, one of the things James Joyce um, is very um, taken by Nietzsche's notion of eternal recurrence. And we see it in Finnegan's Wake and we see it in Molly Bloom's soliloquy. But Joyce completely, exactly as you expressed, Larry, um, Joyce sees it as this very, very, you know, Dionysian in the traditional sense. Um, yeah. He doesn't see that right now, um, you know, Richard Dawkins talks about the about the digger wasp because the digger wasp was so important to Darwin. Um, the digger wasp for, you know, Darwin, is, he, he, his faith in God is almost completely destroyed when he noticed that digger wasps lay their eggs in the body of a still living caterpillar. And then it, they, it, they, the digger wasp brings food to the caterpillar to keep the caterpillar alive so that when the eggs hatch, they have a fresh supply of meat to eat their way out of the body of this still living caterpillar, you know? Now, Nietzsche has no... No, no doubts. This is the nature of the real. It's, it's, you know, it's, it, it's struggle at this level. And many times this struggle will take the form of cooperation. It will take the form of altruism, uh-huh. but this simply masks and veils the, the selfishness underneath. And so we might think of a, of a, of a watering mm-hmm. hole in which you would have, um, you would have like, relative peace between fully satisfied alligators and deer on the other side but in a time of drought the alligators will turn cannibalistic you know yeah. and so too in our society um we will veil our will to power with um with a whole host of ethical principles this is why someone said recently and and, and John Milbank um retweeted their article i think quite rightly that foucault would have been fundamentally opposed to wokeism um, and I think Foucault probably would because Foucault was was well grounded in Nietzsche. And so what Foucault would have seen is that this is simply a ruse of power. And I think people on many levels see the self-aggrandizement of seeing, look at, I am so virtuous, I am so wise, I am so inclusive, as nothing more than a than a barbed, dare I say, a fascistic 
grab at, yeah. at, 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 at you know at power. Um, this is something that we in the West have lost, but. Augustine knew it quite well. Hildegard knew it quite well. There's a letter where Hildegard um, chides um, this um, this nun that she had sent away, and the and and the nun says to you know Hildegard, like, what did I do wrong? I was singing beautifully, and Hildegard says yes, but you were not singing in harmony with the others. You were using your voice to elevate yourself over the others, to draw the gaze onto you. Whereas you should have been seeking to, to raise up everybody by seeing harmoniously. That degree of humility would have been an acceptance of the Holy Spirit. But your, what she doesn't call will to power, your desire to, to, to stand out was actually a rejection of the Holy Spirit and an assertion of yourself. And so people like Augustine, when he's saying, you know, when I love singing the Psalms, what am I loving? Am I loving the gaze? Am I loving the, the, the affirmation? You know, um, th they're attuned to this. Nietzsche is attuned to us, but we are spectacularly, I think, um, blunt to this, that to, to this reality going on. How, you know, Augustine is that wonderful phrase that most, that the that the virtues of the pagans are just glittering vices. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he, that's right. I totally forgotten about that quote. That That's an, uh, that's a fantastic quote. I've got to remember that one again. Rodney. What do you have? What say ye, sir? Yeah, no, I have a follow-up, I think, question, comment, or both, or we'll see. Uh, yeah. But it, it seems to me that one of the, one of the values of Nietzsche, uh, the one, one of the reasons that we should read him, is that, especially, I think, maybe in Catholic circles, we have this, but maybe not just Catholic circles, but I think especially Catholic circles, yeah. we have this exaggerated notion that if you take Christianity and subtract all the supernatural bits, Trinity, resurrection, et cetera, et cetera. What you're left with is natural, uh, you know, uh, what do we get? secular morality, right? Yeah. And so yeah. a lot of, uh, you know, Catholics around the time of the council sort of got very chummy with secular liberalism or liberalism because it seemed hospitable to Catholic morality and then who cares if we have to go to church to talk about the Trinity or, or, or something like that, right? So there's a there's an easy piece to be made with liberalism because liberalism is just Christianity without the supernatural bits. And also, if, if, and, and to take a step farther, and this will link it to your other book, and I'd like you to comment on this too, because we kind of got into this last time, but maybe not as far as, I, as we could have. You end up with a kind of notion of natural law as being simply when you take away all the supernatural bits, what you're left with is a head stock. No, oh, excuse me, Rodney, it kind of cut out a little oh, bit. Yeah. So, so if you take what you're left with is what? Uh, if you're, yeah, if you're, what you're left with is Aristotle or maybe Plato okay. or something like that. And I've been listening to some things by Andrew Willard Jones lately, where he talks about the fact that that, that we forget that Plato and Aristotle were pagans in a very, very important way and never, even on the natural level, achieve something like Christian morality out of their thing. Like we, so that, so maybe you could speak to some of those things because I think Nietzsche is an ally here in trying to correct this, yeah, this mistaken path. In my my opinion, at least. Yeah, I I think that's a really 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 great point, Rodney. Um, good or bad, the the tyranny of the banal book is very very informed by Nietzsche. Um, let me use let me use an example. If the human person is what Nietzsche says they are, which is the human person absent God, um, then when the person thinks they're doing wonderfully morally good acts, they are quite likely doing acts for their own self-aggrandizement. And therefore, as I think Paul is clear, I think, you know, when I read Romans, um, when Paul is critiquing the law, I think this is his his fundamental argument, that only through the ontological transformation of the person can we do the good. That um, Because Romans 7, you know, because I can't do the good I want to do. This body has got to be ontologically transformed by the presence of the Holy Spirit if I'm to become capable of doing the good that I want to do. Um, and so, you know, let's say we take... And this is the problem with like like with all forms of legalism. Let's say we take um I may have mentioned this the last time as well because it's an example that that, that constantly speaks to me. But but let's say I am um 
you know, suffering in poverty and, um, you know, Larry Chap and Rodney Hauser, two, you know, notable Christians, um, take pity on me in my absolute destitute state. And so they both decide to give me a thousand dollars, you know, but let's say, um, and so from the outside perspective, from the secular perspective, from most people's perspective, from the perspectives of all those Catholics after the council, that's fine. They're both doing the exact same thing. But for Nietzsche and Augustine and Aquinas, they may be doing very, very different things on the ontological level, which can't be seen. And so, for example, in the in, in this example, Rodney is giving me a thousand dollars because it, fe- it makes him feel really good, you know. And so, what he's doing is he's spending a thousand dollars for something that he could get cheaper if he just bought cocaine, <laughs> you know. He's getting this high, or he's or he's buying social capital. He's buying um, he's buying power and ascent. In one sense, you know, Bill Gates has spent his entire life in seeking to be the highest. Now he'd sought to do that using using money um, and using capital and now he's using charitable acts you know he's a bit like king louis in um who sings i'm the king of the swingers um in in the jungle book you know the jungle book that's right you know and he says yeah. you know i've reached the top and had to stop but now i want to be a man man cop you know? yeah <laughs> so right. too bill gates wants to wants to move into the moral stage or madonna conquers the pop world and then all of a sudden she develops an english accent and buys an aristocratic english house you know she seeks it's it's still part of the same of the same thing that hasn't changed but in this analogy, Larry um, is doing it by virtue of the fact that Larry is conformed to Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's yes. ontologically changed, and he sees me as as being one with Christ because Christ, God was in Christ reconciling himself into the poor from all eternity. And so, therefore, he, he is ontologically transformed and participating in the life of the Trinity in his gift of $1,000 to me. Uh, and so they're ontologically not just different, they're actually opposite acts they both look the exact same but they're opposite acts and someone might say but that doesn't matter david dean still gets a thousand dollars richer but there will be a but but the world hasn't changed in rodney's thousand dollars and there will be a million more impoverished people who will be thrown on the spikes of this violent world but in but 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 in Larry's situation, the world has ontologically changed. It's a different world, and so th- this is why this is why so much um, Catholic moral theology, when it moves to focus on on rules and takes the focus away from the ontological lens, fails so spectacularly because what can look identical is ontologically completely different. And Nietzsche, you know, get that. What is happening behind the act augustine gets that what is happening behind the act aquinas gets that and so these good things we do aquinas says it is good it is good that we build houses and vineyards there are many things we do which are good if you like by nature but without constant attention these good things will true concupiscence um, be gravitationally pulled into vice. And so, for example, I love my children. I care for my children. This is good. This is, I do this by nature. And yet at Christmas, I will spend ridiculous amounts of money on my children when there are kids starving in other parts of the world. And so concupiscence has taken my my good, <laughs> my love for my children, and gravitationally pulled it into vice. This inevitably, ha- you know, inevitably happens with our, you know, with our moral actions. Only ontological transformation can make me capable of doing the good. Um, and I think this is where this is where Nietzsche is devastating to, like you know, to liberalism in general. That without ontological transformation, every seemingly good moral action is simply another ruse of violence. Um, this is, you know, liberal modernity keeps us on this hamster wheel of of liberation, and it's like um, it's like whack a mole. So it's now these people. <laughs> now these people, now these people. Yeah. And it just keeps us on this thread. But all we're doing is finding mechanisms to elevate ourselves you know um and nietzsche makes us attentive to that the theological tradition is attentive to that and strangely so many moral thinkers today christian and non-christian are completely blind to that because they're they're rousseauian rather than hobbesian yeah yeah Yeah. absolutely Uh, rodney do you have a follow-up to that or did you no, that's great. I mean, that's kind of that's 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 what I wanted to hear. I mean, I, I just as a kind of an aside that's uh, relevant. Um, 
if you if you trace, I've been reading a lot of Chesterton for this project I'm working on, but he's so interesting. The relationship between Nietzsche and Chesterton, I think, is an interesting one. And uh, because he grew up in a liberal household, his parents were Unitarian broadly, I would say, or something like that. You know, they kind of believed in God and they, they weren't uh, they weren't militant agnostics or atheists or anything, but they certainly weren't you know church attending you know they didn't bother with all the the details and the rituals and all that stuff um and so you know Nietzsche had or I'm sorry Chetrin had a very profound sense of justice for the poor and all these different things and as a young man he goes to Fleet Street and starts being a journalist and stuff and he's and he's writing things in defense of good things he's writing against eugenics he's he wants property for the poor you know and all these things but when he gets there, he realizes that there's been a change in England, that the people that are he's rubbing shoulder with are not liberals sort of still basking in the afterlight of Christianity. But now they're anarchists. They're, they're will to power. They're H.G. Wells, George Bernard Shaw. These guys were flirting with nihil like serious nihilism. And it was actually good for him because it scared him straight. Like he realized that that, that liberalism that he grew up with couldn't live without the roots of Christianity. So it's kind of in a back aspered way, you know, he, yeah. he, he, you know, he came, he came back to the faith almost net his, his, he says, my wife, somebody asked her why, who converted her to Christianity? And her answer was the devil. Very in good. other words, she saw what the devil yeah. looks like and it scared yeah. her. And that's kind of, and he, he takes that as his own thing. So there's a kind of instant, I think, instance of what you're talking about, where we need almost Nietzsche to wake us up yeah. to the, vacuity of this liberal you know charade so that we can uh, once more realize how radical this thing is i think that's exactly right i think it's exactly right nietzsche of course he understood christianity he understood um what christianity was he understood that with that that unless there is a Holy Spirit transforming you doesn't work. And so the idea that you would um, maintain Christian values without Christianity is absurd. Um, where he would differ, of course, from us is that he lopped in Christianity with all these other ruses of power, um, which deny life, which were born of resentment, which were born of a slave morality. And he just wants to unleash what he can, what he considers to be the natural. Is that famous line in the genealogy of morality, where he says the strong are no more culpable in assailing the weak than an eagle is in swooping down upon its prey. Um, and this, I think, is where if someone had to, you know, say where are things going to be in, 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 in 2080, I think that will be uh, that will be where, where things are. I think the. Um, you know, people were often scared of the Christian right. The post-Christian right is infinitely, infinitely scarier. Um, we've been protected from it by um, Tom Holland of Dominion and a yeah. and, and wonderful podcaster. Um, wrote a wonderful article a long time ago about how how Hitler killed the devil, you know, and how and how, you know, Nazism provided as a sort of a template. This is what evil looks like. And we mentioned George Grant's notion of the of of, of the great delay of, of Kant as being the great delayer. There's a sense in which maybe um, fascism in the middle part of the 20th century is the is the great delay on those forces that Chesterton saw emerging in the you know in the early part of the 20th century and in the in the 19th century, because that's the that's the truth that that secular liberalism leads to. Um, I have so little respect for you know for liberals who believe that morality is still possible without god um i believe that they are either intellectually or morally deficient either they're not getting something which is an intellectual skill issue or else they do get it but simply can't face up to it um that's that's the truth of it that's if my body is the way my body is according to darwin if it is a constellation of of genes you know richard dawkins for all his you know flaws talks a lot about the gene for huntington's courier you know which is sort of you know waits in my body and it doesn't switch on when i'm 4 or 14 it waits until after i've reached the age at which i've passed on my dna and therefore passed on it and then it switches on and kills me it's following a genetic program which is its own it's not me you know and my body is a constellation of these of these genetic orientations and me as a constellation of these things 
I need salvation. I need ontological transformation by the Holy Spirit conforming me to Jesus Christ, or else everything I do will be a ruse of power. And um, and whether that power is manifest in a very ugly, grotesque fashion, as in someone like Donald Trump, or if it's manifest in a in a in a in a, in a clueless, veiled fashion, as in um, what what those who would consider themselves bleeding heart liberals, they're both exact exactly the same as ruses of power, you know. Um, one of the exercises we did, I worked in a, in a summer as a as a master student um, in a place called Coromila in in Northern Ireland, which worked with um, with teenagers who had been convicted of what was very pleasantly called antisocial activity, which usually meant you know exploding cars, kneecapping people. You know there were <laughs> Catholics or Protestants who were involved in paramilitary, low level paramilitary activity on each side. And one of the exercises we did with them um, was, was 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 quite beautifully Nietzschean in that we showed them pictures of parades. Now, parades are the big flashpoints in Northern Ireland. You've got July 12th, which is the Orange Parade, which the, the Orange Protestant side come out and celebrate King Billy and all the glories of, 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 of Protestant history and culture. And then you have March 17th, you have the St. Patrick's Day Parade where the Green side come out. And we asked them to, we, we took, we engaged them separately and we asked the unionist Protestant kids to describe the faces of the, of the, of the people in the parades. And they said, well, in July 12th, the faces were um, celebratory, they were joyous, they were happy. On March 14th, it was, um, they were threatening, they were, um, you know, aggressive, they were rage filled. And then we asked the kids from the Catholic nationalist side to do the same thing. And they said the exact opposite. They said the faces on July 12th were um, triumphalist, they were aggressive, they were rage-filled, and in these happy, joyous, celebratory faces on St. Patrick's Day, March 7th. <laughs> right. and, and, and then we told them what we had done, that we had changed the faces. Um, so, so that it was the same faces in each, in each set of parades, you know? And so the same face that they were experiencing as aggressive and rage filled or as happy and celebratory was entirely determined by their, by their location and by the, and by the colors that surrounded them and by their own will to power or their own, you know, need for self-assertion. Yeah, yeah. And so we saw that perfectly niche in point that ontology determines epistemology. And unless there is something to transform us, and Augustine saw that, you know, Augustine talks about the fact that without God, without without Christ, without a, an objective um, moral good, which is independent of us, then we're just buffeted about on the, on the winds. Um, he had this sermon where he talks about, um, you know, that we're like a, a boat uh, um, on, on the waves, and we'll just go wherever way the wind blows. And so if, you know, if, you know, good liberals in 21st century Canada would have been good, you know, national socialists in 1930s Germany. Um, the same good people would do the exact same good things because they're just going with the winds of, of, of the tide. But we have the, um, you know, the rope of the Holy Spirit thrown out to us, which moors us to the dock, and then we can find our way home. And without that, we don't have it. Um, Nietzsche knew that. He just didn't believe there was a dock and a rope. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what he did believe is that there was a there was a natural will to power, and the only way that the species could have advance is by letting it run, is by just unleashing it. You know, the eternal recurrence of the same. You know, James Joyce, you know, sees it as a celebratory Dionysian thing. For Nietzsche, it's acts of rape and pedophilia and wildebeest being eaten by lions right now from the tail up, and the Ubermensch. It requires an Ubermensch to say yes to this, you know. Um, it's a question that they often ask liberal interpreters of Nietzsche, you know, that if that if eternal recurrence is simply a celebration of life and good wine and dancing and lovemaking, then why does it require an Ubermensch to say yes to it? <laughs> <laughs> it's only if it's the the absolute horrors um, that we can imagine yeah. that it requires a an an, an over person to like to affirm. It's very it's so interesting. I, I want to come back to your notion of fascism, perhaps the mid 20th century as the great delay. I, I, you know, when I, I've been reading a lot of Augusto Del Noce, I don't know how familiar you are with uh, Del Noce, the uh, late great Italian philosopher, his book, The Problem of, of Atheism, 
I, I recommend highly. Uh, but, you know, he, he's got other books, too. But anyway, uh, he, he points out, you know, it's kind of an open question as to whether or not fascism is a left wing or a right wing phenomenon. <laughs> and, and he uses this to point out the fact that in some ways, when you dig down deeply, uh, these categories just begin to break down. OK, and, and, and what gets exposed is the atheistic core of the whole thing. And, and, and Del Noche says, really, the dogma of the modern world is, quote, today we can no longer believe the following, end quote. And, and, and what he means by that is, of course, very, very similar to what, what Nietzsche was all about. And, and, and Del Noche goes on to note that, therefore, modernity is characterized in its inner soul by a spirit of transgression. Uh, and, and so I, I, I'm, I'm sort of meandering here a little bit, putting, putting pieces together. But I, I do think that Del Noche, when Del Noche mentions Nietzsche a lot, all right, is, is moved by this, by this insight. So the point I'm trying to make is that as, the, as, this, as these categories of left and right break down, as you pointed out, boy, we should really be scared of the post-post-Christian post-Christian right almost as much as the post-Christian left, if not more so. And what we see is sort of they just sort of converge. They converge together. Uh, and in Del Noche's mind, they all converge together in, an, in a great act of transgression to all that has come before, a great erasure of all that has come before as mere perspectivalism and, and so on. And that what we need to do now, uh, both left, right, so on and so forth, is to, in a sense, assert this will to power to to finally. So in other words, so when I look at wokeism and, and you mentioned wokeism as well, all right, it seems to me to be the last gasp in some ways of the ruse of we can have our cake and eat it too. the last gasp of saying we can transgress and transgress and transgress and we can destroy everything that came before. Nothing has any objective meaning, value or good. It's all what we I, I can identify as a cat and they're going to put a cat box in the classroom for me. All right. It's, it, it, and stuff like that. We, we can say all of that in this ultimate act of transgression and then turn around and say, but, you know, God made me this way and it's morally good to be inclusive and to speak on all of this nice language that fits it all still neatly in some kind of bizarro world of secular liberal values. So what I'm wondering, this is actually in the midst of this meander, you know, uh, uh, this meditation on transgression and Del Noche and today we can no longer believe in the great delay of fascism. Are we you, you mentioned 2080? I mean, how how rapidly I th are we approaching this point where the ruse will be over? And that's that's kind of all of my ramble right now was leading up to that question. At what point will the ruse be over? Will it just it just we really will be living in, in a realm where you need an Ubermensch in order to in order to, to in a sense to survive this? Yeah, that's a it's a it's a scary thought. Um, it, like it really is. I think that I think that I think that more and more people are are seeing through the ruse. Um, my children are in a, a a private school for my sins um, in order to get Catholic education. But like most bourgeois kids, they are being educated in um, in the right things to say. Um, and so in the same way that etiquette would have prepared them in the in the 1900s to dance in a certain way and to wear their hair in a certain way and their bows in a certain way now they're being trained as to how to how to how, you know how to perform with the right pronouns and how to how to say the right things and how not to avoid the right things and in so doing they will um they will be clearly visible as the as the right kind of people the you know the good kind of people i think um you know we could do another talk at some stage on mark but I think um, if if Marx is right and all history is a history of class struggle, then I think more and more um, we're seeing that um, that the wokest movement is you know a movement which is um, which is a ruse of the bourgeoisie to maintain to maintain power. Um, so I think more and more people are you know are seeing through that. Um, th 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 
the the fascist pie um the right and the left have you know have different have different pieces of it um the right certainly have the you know the will to power side the 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 assertion of the natural side um the the vokish elements um yeah, the, yeah. the left have the uh the uh giovanni gentile um state that 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 we can't know what is good, what is not good, but we can know what the state has decided is good or not good. And then the state will decide, and then we will we will simply follow that. And all questions about whether the state is right or not, or or or, or, or what is what is what is true or what is false, um, is subordinate to the democratic process which decides the state, and then the state will implement this. Um, this is something I think that is sort of Lenin, um, quite rightly so, and all those deba debates with Rosa Luxemburg. You know, the problem with the proletariat is they don't know that the proletariat. The problem with the proletariat is that they don't, they, that you know, they're not they're not proper Bolsheviks, and so we need state control and we need to educate them, we need to force them to see that they have been oppressed, and we need to force them to to to, to get beyond their false consciousness. And so um, Marxism quickly becomes under Lenin, um, you know, state driven totalitarianism. And so, too, the left, I think, today, you know, maintains the idea that the state is the good. The sta and, and whether that is in relation to an issue in which I would I'd agree with the left in relation to gun control, the state should be the only weaponized group and everybody else should not have weapons or in areas that I wouldn't control, that the state is the full and final arbiter of morality. Um, which is, you know, which is a massive problem. Um, so I, I, I think that more and more people are seeing through the, the wokeism, and I think wokeism is 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 you know is collapsing. But I think the left will um, simply m m continue the Kantian project of bracketing what is true, um, and simply saying, well. Our side has decided this. We have elected these people, and now this state will implement this truth. And we won't have these first order conversations about what is good or bad. It will simply descend into this into this tribalism. And then on the other hand, you have the nightmare of um, what you see with people like um, Andrew Tate, and what you see with um, so many young men who are Prothonochians, who are we just need to express our natural. Um, and um, and assert ourselves and dominate, and I think this is this is very very problematic. But again, these are reasons why that the that the public debate, because it is inherently godless, is um. You know the, you know people. I, one of the things which absolutely rots me about our our collective agreement here is that we're allowed to take time out of work to go on an extended sabbatical for public office, you know, which seems to be suggesting that the state has some kind of capacity to bring about the good. And, and largely it doesn't, whereas the church, which is where these people are acting, this can bring about the good. We can't make Canada the kingdom of God. It's not going to happen. But we can make this parish look like the kingdom of God, you know? And so yeah. um, I think more and more Christians will hopefully um, return to an early Christian model of praying for um, the state, even if it does lead to our, even if they are trying to kill us, um, while getting on with the business of the moral life um, um, beneath beneath the beneath the state. <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Go ahead, Rodney. Question. Sorry, Larry. Um, no, go ahead. Yeah. So. <clears throat> You know, kind of in the light of what you just, how you just kind of finished there and what you just said, but then going back to the problem of, you know, you being a serious Catholic man with kids in this culture, you know, going to private school, et cetera, et cetera, and yet, um, picking up what what Flannery O'Connor would call their manners, right, from from the culture, the the broader culture. The question I have, and I don't know, I'm not sure I know the answer to this. So this is, this is not a rhetorical question. It's a real question that, that, that I think is worth thinking about is can the church survive for long um, if, it, if, 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 if it kind of is under the impression that the, the culture that we have around us is broadly, let's say, neutral or whatever. Um, we're going to 
make sure people are catechized and baptized and confirmed and all that good stuff. But either there's nothing to fear about the secular West, because most people are decent people, you know, or another position would be we create our own counterculture, like kind of a catacombs approach where we, you know, kind of isolate ourselves out, et cetera. It seems to me that it's possible that maybe neither of those is true and that what we do need to hope for, at least, whether we can achieve it or not, is to kind of try our best to re-Christianize culture. To, to, you know, I mean, I mean, the, Christopher Dawson is a big influence here, but, you know, he yeah. says there was no such thing up until modernity as a society that didn't stem from a religion which produced a culture, which produced a, a, a political order, right? And now what we're trying to do is something brand new where we have a, a allegedly value neutral, let's say metaphysically neutral political order, which then produces an allegedly political or a, a theologically neutral culture. And then we have individuals making the big decisions for themselves in, in private. Do you have any thoughts about how we negotiate that as Catholics. I think that I think you and Larry are infinitely, um, you know, wiser and and better informed on those topics than me. I'm 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 grappling my way through them. Um, you mentioned Andrew Willard Jones earlier, and obviously his, you know, before Church and State is I think is a you know is a real landmark, um, you know, moment in in, in thinking through these things. Um, I honestly am conflicted. Um, the one thing that I would say with, and, and, I, and I'm saying this because there's parts, so much of the integralist project, um, convinces me and much, and some of it repels me, but that, that, that revulsion could simply be because, um, a lackey in a lickspittle of the, of, of, of bourgeois ideology, um, to, you know, to, to quote Marx. Yeah. Um, but what you mentioned the culture absolutely um the culture is is not necessarily the state and um and and what we're suffering is the is a babylonian captivity of the moral imagination and how do we um how do we help our imaginations be christified and here nietzsche can help the one thing that i insist on my daughters knowing is 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 some nietzsche <laughs> um, <laughs> they have to be able to smell the bullshit in the yes. in, in, in 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 liberal ideology um now they can make their own choices and they'll certainly have you know a huge amount of catholicism you know there for me um in terms of that but 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 they have to be able to see through it and so once once we have nietzsche inflicted uh so we can't have a lazy um you know habitation of this supposedly neutral but in fact utterly adversarial um solvent of christian faith um ryan burgess is that his name he's a christian sociologist who who does sociology of religion but you know for a couple hundred years now every single generation has been less religious than the previous one every single one you know which again just proves that the modern secular west is a solvent of religious faith and I do think that we need to um, re-Christianize the culture, but this is primarily, uh, and at first, a deconstruction of the tyranny of the culture, and a re-Christification um, of our of, of of our theological imaginations. Um, and this this takes doing, you know. Um, my wife and I have been reading, you know, Larry's book, um, his Confessions, and it's it, it it's tremendously helpful. And I was speaking to a, a Muslim imam um, in relation to something completely different on Sunday. And I was asking him, you know, do, do you guys have a similar problem in relation to your children? Um, you know, the, the, the struggle to keep them Muslim. What's this, this like? And he says, yeah, it's a, you know, it's a problem for us too. And he, and he said that when he was a kid, you know, back in um, Syria, um, you know, you'd look up at the stars and you'd see the stars and Every, you know the vastness of the universe. You know the the immensity of God. You can't not. You know He says now I come over here and my kids look up and they don't see anything. That in this city you never see the stars. He says how can I raise my kids to know God? <laughs> you know. And it was very interesting the way that from the earliest possible times, the very even when they look up. 
their 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 be the, the the reality of God is being veiled from them. When they go to school, they're told to pretend, to think, to act, and speak as if there was no God. You know, right. all your arguments have got to have got to exclude the reality of God. You have got to pretend to be a secular atheist in order to function in this space. And so this is a very dangerous, um, it, it is a solvent of religious faith. And then the question becomes, how best as Christians to respond to that? And here I would definitely defer to to both of you who have, you know, have been thinking about this um, in, a, in a more advanced way than I have. Mm. In many ways, it's an anthropological crisis, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the sense, you know, going back to Rodney's idea that he said at the very beginning, you know, that modern secularism has this sort of belief that if you just scrape away the barnacles of all the supernatural bits, you're going to be left with this substrate of, well, of human nature. And I mean, and, and you get these silly like Jeffersonian ideas, you know, it's self-evident that we're endowed by our creator with, well, no, it isn't self-evident, but this is, this is yeah. once again, part of this ruse uh, that, you know, that the substrate is secular. The substrate is neutral towards the God question. And, and that is just presumed to be the boilerplate position out of which we are to act that there is no God in terms of our nature, that this is like sprinkles on ice cream. It's just sort of super, super added on at the end. So it seems to me that in, in re-evangelizing culture, that there's, there's a sense in which we have to begin with a, a deconstruction of this false notion, this false anthropology. So I think you're right, David, that it, it's, it's a demo. I always say that when I used to teach at the sales, half of the first half of all my classes was a demolition project. <laughs> And, and a lot, and I know Rodney does the same thing. You use a lot of humor, a lot of sarcasm in order to point out the sheer lunacy and absurdity of the idea that we're going to construct an entire ordo out of the notion that there's no such thing as an ordo. Uh, and, and, and that we're going to then have a purely stipulative set of rights, a purely stipulative morality. Like you were saying, the state's going to tell us what our morality should be. And everything's going to be good that flows from that. And of course, you begin to show how absurd this is. And that's why I asked you the question earlier about sort of a timeline. When when is the shit going to hit the fan? Let's just put it that way. All right. Because I, I, I think that in order to retrieve a proper anthropology, a, a proper starting point where, where we recovered that Dawson-esque idea that human nature is inherently religious and cultures flow out of that inherent religiosity, it, it seems to me there's going, there has to be before we can reinvigorate that anthropological vision, there's going to have to be, um, there's going to, we're going to have to reach a critical mass of absurdity that causes most people for the scales to fall off of their eyes. I mean, it's, it's an old fashioned idea. You got to hit rock bottom before, yeah. before people are willing. So I'm not willing the destruction of our cultures, so that, but this is the point. It, it is, our friend Father Robert in Belly has driven this point home over and over that it's an anthropological crisis. And we've decapitated the church. We've decapitated Christ out of our, our approach to things when we water down the faith so much. And this is another imbellyism. You know, we had this decapitated church, and it goes to your idea, David, you know, that we can't do the good until we're ontologically changed from within. Now, if we've decapitated the church and we remove Christ, how can we po possibly then have a proper theological anthropology as an alternative to modernity? How can we possibly then preach this ontological change that needs to take place? If we're trying to meet secularity halfway in some sort of bizarre middle ground, then we're ceding the territory, are we not? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's, um, in the introduction to before church and state, Andrew Willard Jones, you know, makes that point very, very well. That even in supposed Christian alternatives, when they're staking out a Christian space, they're yeah. doing so on the basis of the of you know of ceding the the normal, ceding time and space to the secular. Um, yeah, I think you're you know you're hundred percent right. The um, the full consequences of the point you've made are are painful by virtue of the fact that when we think about you know, we think about ref quote unquote reforms in the liturgy. We think about 
all of these things, they are born of the exact same secularizing impulse. Um, they are born of the exact same flattening, um, and and uh, you know, and 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 the surrender to Babylon, um, and that's a real that's a real problem. If ontological transformation is a necessary precondition of doing the good, because only God is truly good. Yeah. Um, then how can we seek to do any good without this this process? I you know I, I, it's you know it's painful. I, on Sunday we took um, we went to a, a a different mass away from the parish that we normally go to, and um, and the priest was simply preaching material heresy. Um, <laughs> he was just out and out. You know he was you know he was talking about the way that as children we learn various things and we need to you know to put those to one side and you know and sort of you know and, and forget them. And the example he gave was Marian devotion, which he completely misunderstood and. And and at one stage he said, and Mary would be spinning in her grave if she if she saw what we did. Today. <laughs> it's just made me, you know, um, uh, yeah. it was it, it was pain. And so you know, and so we do have an absolute crisis on our hands, and um and the and the rock bottom is, you know, again how we 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 you know we keep on breaking through the glass floors and <laughs> reaching another rock bottom and another rock bottom. But there is there is clear there, there is clear change. I would doubt that um that that statistic about each generation being less religious than the previous one. I I don't think that will hold for much longer. And there's plenty of evidence to suggest that it's already changing. Um, in many parishes here, um, you know, mass attendance um hasn't gone down since two thousand and eight. Um, last year here in in our archdiocese, we um we set a record at least in this century for adult baptisms, um and so things are clearly turning, particularly among young men. And um, you know, I'm not a massive huge fan of 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 Jordan Peterson, but people like Jordan Peterson and others have had a big influence on 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 helping the scales to fall from the eyes of some some young men, and um and that's a wonderful thing. I think of uh, someone like J.K. Rowling in, in the UK, the author of the Harry Potter stories, who's been railing against transgenderism. So, I, you know, I, I, I've harbored the fantasy that maybe transgenderism is, is the bridge too far that might cause people to suddenly start stepping back. Because here you have J.K. Rowling saying, no, 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 and many, many others, you know, trans exclusive radical feminists or whatever, TERFs as they're called, saying, all right, feminism, yes, but no to all of this to all of this transgenderism, but nevertheless, and, and here's my point, nevertheless, it doesn't lead JK Rowling or people who think like her to then reconsider maybe Christianity to reconsider classical metaphysics and classical ways of viewing things in the Christian faith. No, no, there's still, there's still a bitterness towards the faith. There's a bitterness towards the church. Uh, a chip on our shoulder, an epistemological block. I don't know what you want to call it, but there is a barrier. There is a cultural barrier to the reacceptance of Christianity. Uh, and I know we're off the topic of Nietzsche now, but this this has fascinated me now for, for a long time, and which makes me wonder if maybe we're not better off with a post post Christian environment than simply a post. The post Christian one is bitter but maybe a post post Christian one would not be anyway. I don't know what you might think about that. And then Rodney can say, can you I want just, to add yeah, on? Yeah. 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 Interject something just to kind of bring Nietzsche back into the conversation, but also just to piggyback on what you just said, Larry. Um, it does seem to me that there are some people for whom the, the, as far as we've gone, have been a little bit of a wake up call and, and Peterson would be one of them. Again, I have difficult, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't hold with, uh, you know, a good bit of what he talks about, but there is at least an openness there that is not typical of, of highly trained, you know, people in his field. There's also John Verveke. Uh, you probably know about him, David, because he's another Canadian uh, on the other side of the, on the other side of Canada, though. But, uh, and he's even perhaps more interesting in terms of his philosophical acumen, I think, than, than, than Peterson. Uh, there's the Ian McGilchrist, Larry. I know you were talking about him with your last guest. Who's a Kale Zeldin and I discussed mm -hmm. McGilchrist. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So these are very interesting, highly educated people who were trained in naturalism, materialism, reductionism, et cetera, et cetera. There's the there's a biologist whose name I'm forgetting right now, but he's also kind of doing this. So I do think that we are starting to see 
people who are willing to reconsider, uh, you know, trying to come in term to terms with reality again. But to go back to Nietzsche, and I think this is perhaps the most important takeaway that I take from your work, David, is that it is absolutely the case that <clears throat> sociologists of religion will tell us if a person is dedicated already to a religious tradition that they find makes sense of their lives and, and things like that, uh, it's very, very hard to get them to convert. It's very, very hard to go to Middle East and try to convert Muslims to Christianity because we're half, you know, <laughs> You know, we're half secularized bougie types anyhow, and they're devout. Why would they, you know, why would they join a religion that's that's kind of half-baked or whatever? But I think if we start to see secular liberalism as something like a religion, we realize what we're up against. Because if, if we just think of it as this neutral space within which we can all choose our own worldview and stuff like that, then we're, we're cooked. But yeah. if we see it as, in fact, uh, something analogous to a religious tradition, and I think it is, I think it's a Christian heresy, actually, then pointing that out to people, which is something that Nietzsche can help us with, because yes. Nietzsche is the great exposer of liberalism, the the, the, the yeah. insufficiency of it, yeah. even from secular grounds, right? That, is, I think, is an enormous help. And I think that's what you were talking about, Larry, with, with in our classes. My, again, the first third of my intro to theology class is trying to expose to them the fact that secular liberalism is is a is a myth and it's it's, it's a quasi religion it's not self evident at all and really really smart people like nietzsche knew that and exposed it as, as not being self evident and and, <laughs> and it was really for some of them that's a big moment cuz now they've yeah. lost their security blanket yeah. and they don't feel so comfortable <laughs> without some other confession of faith so to speak or something like that so i think yeah. i actually think Larry, you you stumble on that when you said you know kind of this, or, or, or David, you said it first, a deconstruction has to happen first. Yeah. As yeah. long as somebody is secure in this myth that we can all get along, you know, without any common vision of the good, it, it, yeah. it's, 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 it's crazy. Yeah. And I, I think that's, that's what I think one of the main reasons why did, why J.K. Rowling hasn't and, and others like her haven't made that step forward. They haven't spent enough time on Nietzsche or haven't read Nietzsche at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. They still believe the old um, idiocy that all right-thinking people can agree X, and um, and then they have strange things where they need to psychologize the alternative perspective and say, well, this is some form form of hysteria, which it, which of course it may be, but their assumption that all right-thinking people should agree on this is you know is false. I think more Nietzsche and more deconstruction can help them get there. But I think another reason why they won't touch Christianity, and this is one of the great shames, and Nietzsche helps me live in this shame along with Augustine and others, um, is because we have, be because we've been afraid for our careers, because we've wanted to be accepted by um, our culture despisers um, down the halls in our universities, that we haven't gone to the cross. And what, what going to the cross, I think, looks like um, might be that when we are going through something like the residential schools crisis here in Canada, and when there's a particular narrative being offered, Catholic theologians like me shouldn't be silent or shouldn't worse play along. Um, we've got to be able to say that in addition to certain bad papal bulls, um, there was also sublimus deus to say, to make the point again and again, that the more churchy you were, the better you were, the less churchy you were, the worse you were, <laughs> that the that the secular was always the, by far the most, um, the most abusive and the most, and, and, the, and the most aggressive. And we, that's not a, a job that I think, you know, priests and bishops can be expected to do. That's a job that we theologians should be doing. But the vast majority of us, all we want is in this Nietzschean fashion to climb up the ladder, to be seen as better, um, to, you know, to play the polite game in polite society in advance. And Nietzsche holds a mirror up to those who do that. Careerism Careerism has uh, castrated Catholic theology and rendered it incapable of, um, of, of, of supporting the church during this period of decline. Um, and we have somehow got to find a way of when we're asked, are we with the Galilean, <laughs> um, that we that we don't say no. Yeah. 
Um, and and this comes at the toughest times. And so this story about the church's complicity in colonization, the church's complicity in all those things, I need to think, I think we need to speak more coherently about that. I think um, Tom Holland helps us by speaking about yeah. the way that um, that you know the Protestant English and, and German, and then you know secular French stories about the the Dark Ages and about the medieval world um, were false and were polemical and 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 and, and are not fit for purpose. Um, but as long as those stories abide, it's going to be really difficult. Like, why would J.K. Rowling say yes, fascism? I'll take some of that, please. Um, when well, like when the name of Christianity is so tarnished. Um, why would you go yes. there? So it's going to take work from us and um, it's going to require us to be less um, careerist, um, less um, adding the hapens to the pence and prayer to shivering pair within our, like within our, you know, our secular universities. And not to be afraid to be a bit aggressive. I mean, one of the, one of the flaws, it seems to me, in, in our in our own self-analysis as to what went wrong, <laughs> what did the church what did do wrong? And, and it's precisely always put in those terms. As we look at the decline of the church, we say, well, here's what the church did wrong, X, Y, Z, and here's what the church needs to do better but in order to get past these epistemological barriers that have arisen where people are bitter towards the church. The fact is, though, that one can also say that perhaps 25% of the church's decline in the West has to do with mistakes made by the church, but maybe 75% is the result of an aggressive secularism that had it out for the church, okay? Yeah. That, that this was an intentional and designed effort to smear the Christian faith and the Catholic faith in particular, uh, that this is not simply a cultural drift towards a kind of anti-Catholic mentality. The choices were made. In order, and, and this is the benefit of Tom Holland and, and books like yours, The Tyranny of the Banal, uh, where we, we're a little more aggressive. We're saying, no, wait a minute. No, 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 no. You guys have foisted this narrative upon us. Um, and so, so the, what I'm leaning up to then is this. OK, neat, back to Nietzsche. Nietzsche then would be the great destroyer of liberalism and its pretensions. So in some sense, then Nietzsche becomes the godfather of a kind of post-liberal way of, th or in his case, in the middle of liberalism <laughs> and the rise of liberalism, you know, articulating a post-liberal vision. But there's going to be then alternative post-liberal visions. How do we how do we get so, you know, you, you get like the new polity guys and other guys. You mentioned integralism earlier. How do we get to a post-liberal way of thinking where People like us, like the three of us and people who think aren't immediately simply dismissed as integralist fascists, because that's exactly I mean, you see this right now with the caricature of like Patrick Deneen and others like him, whereas anybody on the left or in secular culture that talks about Patrick Deneen, it's always, well, crypto fascist, scary, white nationalist, chauvinistic, homophobic jerks from hell, you know, um, how do we get past this? I mean, I know I'm asking a very open ended question, so but it, but it's a burning one right now. If we, and I was talking once a long time with D.C. Schindler about this. How do we how do we smash certain stereotypes about what it means to be post liberal? Maybe we need to be better at defining what it means to be post liberal. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think. Um, we have, I, I hope um models um you know i think i think saint paul is a genius is one of the greatest um geniuses we've had um he needs to create space for christ by deconstructing the law um and and, and the notion of the self-sufficiency of the law um people are saying that christ is a is an answer to is, is an answer to a question that they're not asking and have no need to ask and so he needs to create that first yeah. and so i think that we need to con but, but he does so in a way which doesn't i think which doesn't alienate and so i think that we need to be able to show how the the forms of liberalism and indeed liberal wokeism um, are participatory in maintaining the exact kinds of horrors that they seek to overcome. And so, you know, for example, showing with Nietzsche how so much 
um, the high stuff is in fact a one more ruse of of of, of the white bourgeoisie to to maintain power. You know um, that um, that the by many metrics um, the civil rights movement hasn't really worked that well for African Americans. So what what are these metrics? These metrics are infant mortality, which um you know which which relative to the white population um has worsened since 1968. Home ownership is only the exact same. Um statistics like incarceration rates have gone through the roof, you know. The only really metrics that have improved are metrics that benefit the wealthy and powerful. For for example, students at universities <laughs> where they're going to be paying, we're going to be paying powerful. And so so I think showing on their terms how these you know how these things end up is you know is a problem. Um, one of the things that happens in Canada constantly is that the churches are blamed for um, you know for the brutalization of the indigenous people, and they're blamed in such a way that the state then doesn't have to do anything, and and the problems continue on. Here in Nova Scotia, we've got First Nations areas that have no running water in 2024. You know, wow. and we and, and and we have that at a time that um, Justin Trudeau will constantly blame. Well, um, you know, the churches were responsible for this. The churches were responsible for that, and then we are complicit in that by. By, by the grammar of apologies. And so from an Achean perspective, an apology is a, is, a, is a ruse for power. I say sorry that I'm one of the good ones, that I'm elevated, that, I, that I'm affirmed by everyone as one of, the, one of the compassionate ones and one of the positive ones. But what I've done is I've reified the tyrannical narrative, which continues the oppression of um, First Nations people by the exact same secular forces that fueled it in the past. You know, yeah, and yeah, so yeah. we do this kind of thing all the time. And so I think we I, I think we need to ask, I think we need different kinds of apostles and we need different kinds of, um, of, of people working. We need some who simply are, as you suggest, you know, less meek. Um, and then we need also some who um, are able to speak to them on their, you know, on their own terms, as as many of the greats, as many of the greats were. Um, and then we also need to realize that within spaces like Twitter, we're not engaging people. Um, we're simply engaging, um, you know, that is sort of that, that if we are will to power, if we if we if we crave the dopamine of affirmation, that so uh -huh. much social media has just evolved as a way of giving us these drips. And so all we want to do is say that Amy Coney Barrett is the devil. People will like that. We get these little hits of dopamine and we move on. Um, we're reduced to the level of a hamster by these things. And I think it would be very, very foolish to to assume that this is in any way real, you know? And so all those people having a go at Pat Deneen and others, um, they're not real people. They're like, they're like, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're hamsters sucking at the teeth of dopamine that comes from saying that they're fascists. They're, 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 they're reduced to simply yeah. a craving, yeah. you know? Yeah. I think to, uh, I know we're, I saw Kelly walk in there, Rodney, his wife. So I, you, you might have to go soon. I don't know. Uh, well, we're we're, we're going pretty long here, but that I want to, you know, it just seems to me that this one of my things too, is that part of the problem with the church right now is that it, it doesn't too many people in the church don't get too many leaders in the church don't get what it is that we're talking about here. I often say there's two kinds of leaders in the church, those who understand the crisis that we're in and those who do not. And, and, and it seems to me there's there's still this inbuilt status quoism in, in the church hierarchy and among so many priests. There's this sort of play it safe, let's drive straight down the middle of the road sort of mentality, which means then that any any proposal for an alternative to the current liberal order, any post liberal or the bishops and most priests are fearful of whether it's paleo anarchism on the right or radical Marxist notions on the left or some other sort of Catholic integralist sort of crazy notions of a hard Catholic state or something. They see no alternative to the liberal ordo. And so they fear the disordo. And so they naturally feed into then this milk toast sort of approach to pastoral ministry without a prophetic edge. So it seems to me we need to make Christianity bizarre again. We need to make it weird again. We need to make it freakish again. <laughs> I'm ranting, but anyway. Yeah, I mean, just one, one, beautifully. Go ahead, Rodney. 
Yeah, no, just a, a point there that uh, I think a, kind of an Augustinian point is important here. He pointed out that the difference is between Christians and their pagan Roman uh, you know, counterparts was not just moral or political differences, but that the the, the Romans were ba bad, had a bad polity because they worshiped the wrong gods. And I think what happens with a lot of bishops and priests is they don't think theology is very important. They, they just, oh, they yeah. They, so they really, <laughs> it's, it's, right? They have to, they're, they're going to, they see, they're kind of doing this culture war thing on the level of politics, whether they tend to be left or whether they tend to be right. They think the solution to our country's problems is getting the right person in office. Uh, and 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 that's something I, I just think is so non-Augustinian. Augustine, the problems are precisely theological problems, not just intellectually theological. I mean, theological in the real sense of the word of influencing every aspect of our being. Like, what do we think of God? Who is God? What is God? What is a human being? Who is Jesus Christ? I honestly think there there are a, a lot of bishops who just don't think those those are church matters. Let's not worry too much about the you know that it's it's it and they're really then they're that's forced. not bicker about ukulele, eh? yeah, yeah, right, that's right, yeah. So when you start going after liberalism, that makes them nervous because they have a lot of confidence that liberalism, if we just get it right, if we get the right kind of liberalism, is it's gonna it's gonna solve the problems yeah. for us, yeah. And I think Nietzsche is helpful there too. Yeah, very much so. Um, uh, but uh, we seem to have stumped David. <laughs> no, I agree. I, 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 I don't want to, you know, as, as, as Aquinas says, any addition is a subtraction. Um, I think that, um, like, like Rodney just hit the nail on the head there. I think that's, that's exactly the problem that, um, that being, um, you know, the chaplain of secular capitalism is the, is the, is the place the church has occupied since yeah. 1970 at least and it's and it's happy enough there and that's an absolute tragedy but i do think that a new generation is coming on what what worries me greatly is that if my thesis is correct and in order to take our place on the cross as peter is called to when he denies christ that we need um greater infusion by the holy spirit that comes through the sacraments then the question we have to ask ourselves is what is happening liturgically and in other aspects of our life in the church that has that has turned down this this hose that has turned down this flow and that's a that's a truly worrying thing i think you know if we're, why aren't we making as many saints or or or, or as many martyrs i think more you know more importantly um, but you know, certainly, I, I I I couldn't agree more, and I think that 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 change is coming in the church. You know, as as you guys know, and and as I know, theology for all its sins today, it's not as bad as it was, in my opinion. Um, no, in the nineteen nineties, when I think you know many of us were in in undergrads, it's not as it's not as bad as it was then, and so there are signs of there are signs of hope. Um, Pope Francis, who was a good and holy and beautiful man, he is just a boomer to be scored. He's just he's just a product. Oh my goodness! I think you have just hit something really important yeah. that I've said a lot. Okay, <laughs> against all the trads, the Pope's a heretic. The Pope's this. The Pope's that. Now nah, he's a boomer. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah, That's yeah. right. I mean, if you yeah. want to understand Pope Francis, go back and read dredge out your eight track tape player from 1975. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. 100%. All right. Yeah. Then you understand, you know, the, the world of the world of Pope Francis. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I don't want to necessarily end with that, but <laughs> it's, uh, we could. We could. Uh, this has been. Absolutely fascinating conversation. Pardon me for all of my uh, disconnected ramblings in, in the midst of the brilliant analysis that you two have have proffered. Uh, but I, I thought this was a really, really great conversation. And maybe, yeah, David, you you, you, you come back for a part three, part four down the road. I would love it. I would love and, it. I really enjoyed it and benefited greatly from it. And particularly when it comes to to what to do, um, you know, I'm yeah. very much listening Um um, when it comes to theory and, uh, and and using Nietzsche deconstructively, that's that's very much my bag. But when it comes to shaping a genuine post-liberal order, um, I'm learning from you guys. I'm learning from the New Polity guys. I'm learning from Andrew Willard yeah. Jones and other and others, as, as well as the integralists. Um, and 
These are, particularly for Americans, these are really, really important questions. It is an important qu set of questions. I, I have learned this the hard way over the past two years. I've been on the speaking circuit, you know, going everywhere, giving talks. And my talks are, David, they're all like deconstruction. Rodney, you know, yeah. you know, this, you know, I'm, I'm a really good diagnostician. So are you, Rodney? So are you, David? But my talks never make solid proposals. In fact, I will often go out of my way at the very beginning. So I'm not going to give any solid proposal. And then you get the Q&A session afterwards. And every single question is, OK, smarty pants, what are we supposed <laughs> to do? You know, what are we supposed to do? And so I used to dismiss that as well. You know what? That's for you to figure out. I've given you the theoretical tools. Now apply them in your own life and, and you figure out how am I supposed to be a Catholic in this environment when I have 87 children and 10 dogs and so on and so forth. All right. I but you know what? I've come to realize more and more and more that I think it is incumbent upon public intellectuals, what, if that's what you want to call us, Catholic, to actually maybe start making some concrete proposals. If that's So pardon me if I've sort of asked that question too many times today. Like, OK, where is this headed? What do we do? That kind of thing, because I know that's what people want. That's what they're asking for. There's some kind of direction. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that that's that's my so all those li viewers and listeners out there, there there is hope that maybe someday I'll get it and, and there will be <laughs> like a, the trouble is and, and Dave, OK, and I, I keep dragging this on and on and on. David C. Schindler has made this brilliant point, and And I think it's very true because he runs into this same question all the time because he writes on all these same things. And he says the problem with modern day liberalism is not just it's in, that it's worshiping the wrong gods like Radney, you know, and so on. It's that it's so epistemologically hegemonic in our lives that it robs us completely and totally to our core of the imaginative capacity to think differently. Yeah. And that's what I often tell people when I say I'm at a loss to tell you what like you said earlier, David, you're grappling with this. I think we're all grappling mm. with this because we, we, we've been robbed of the imaginative capacity to think outside of the box and to think differently. Because every time we it, to try to think outside, we're labeled fascists, <laughs> yeah. you know. So uh, that's just, I think, our defense here is three dudes thinking out loud. You know, we're, we're victims. OK, we're victims. <laughs> <laughs> We're victims too, damn it. Yeah. All right. Anyway, any last words, David? I'm rambling now yet again today, but today's been a big ramble. No, any, you've any, been any, great. And thank you so much for it. Um, I, yeah, just to reiterate again, that if that is the challenge to um to to overcome the tyrannical hold that um liberal epistemology has in us, then Nietzsche is our friend um for that deconstructive yes. the, that deconstructive place. And Nietzsche, in one sense, may help bring us back to some of the questions I think we faced in the second, third, and you know, and fourth centuries, which uh, I think in many ways gave us the church. You know, that 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 if if the challenge is how do we conform, help people become conformed to Jesus Christ, then how do we build something like a like, you know, a machine for this for this confirmation, a, a space for this infusion by the Holy Spirit? Um, this is the challenge. The, how, how can we be Christiformed? And the church in many ways is a response to that because we've been so colonized by problematic epistemology and ontology. We forget to see that that's what the church does. And then we want to completely tear it down and, and build something else in its stead. But I think that when we think about responses, that's one of the issues that people are saying. So what kind of a secular nation state would you build? You know, yeah, and, that's, yeah. and, 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 and therefore, but, but the precise answer is we wouldn't build another secular nation state. <laughs> um, and so th this this is a challenge. There's a, a lovely little book um, called Debt DBT by um, David Graeber, the, the, the recently deceased anarchist thinker. And he constantly talks about that, you know, it's OK, so you're an anarchist. So what kind of a what kind of a state would you build? <laughs> you <know? laughs> and straight away that becomes the problem. And so sometimes our difficulty answering is, yes, a that we can sound like a fascist for simply offering non-liberal solutions. Um, but two, that our solutions don't start from 
uh, a secular nation state. They don't start from that sort of assumptions. They start from um, a relationship between, uh, you know, a, a fallen bundle of matter like me and the and and and, and the Trinity, um, and that that's the that's the, the that's the that's the start of the answers. And then we build up to then to, to what kind of a sacramental life shapes this, what kind of a prayer life shapes this. And then a good society becomes a society comprised of these good people. And so we start from the other direction, which is not the most satisfying answer for these people because they're colonized. That's a, boy, that's a great way to end this. What you just said, plus Nietzsche is our friend. Yeah, Nietzsche is our friend. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, thanks everyone for listening. And thanks Thank to my so two, much, my, my, so my, much, my sidekick Rodney and uh, David. You are great as always. Hopefully, we'll see you again. Uh, so thanks a lot, everyone. Bye now. Thanks so much.